just on, on the uh, admission of issues up there, the first assignments available to get a freshman pass um, It's been created by Daryl. The second assignment, I posted the solutions last night, so you can take what it goes so long. And um, we'll return those soon. Just, uh, just a note on the grading, and if you have any issues regarding the grades, please pay attention to the following. For assignments, uh, I give the TA absolute discretion on assigning how he has graded the questions. So the TA chooses the allocation and how the mark breakdown is. Um, as a result of that, if there's any issues with the grading that you want to dispute, you should take that up with Daryl and not with me, uh, because he's, a, he's decided how he's allocated the grades. So if you feel that something's not right, um, my policy always with my TAs is I give them a lot of latitude. They get to allocate the grades, but then they also need to justify it to you if you have an issue with it. So uh, please take those issues up with Daryl, and then he'll adjust your grade, and uh, that, that should resolve the issue. If that doesn't work out with you and him, then you can say that. Um, regarding the project, uh, there, most people have submitted their project topics. If you do, if you do not hear back from me, you probably got your first choice. Um, if you, uh, I will go reply to some of these sometime later over the week, weekend or on Friday, to let you know what your final topic actually is. But if, for now, as you can see, uh, if you've got your final selection, you generally have them if you hear back from me. Any questions on the projects or the topics of you before we get started with this? Okay, so just to put this in context, uh, this is a single class in Cyclops. It's not enough time to cover the topic uh, uh, in, a, in any depth. Uh, it is really just for an overview of what Cyclops are about. The main part of the class actually is the second part of the slide where we introduce a new concept in the grade efficiency curve. So Cyclops are a great way to understand and interpret grade efficiency. Uh, but, and then those curves apply to all separation processes that involve solid and fluid. So it's a, um, that's actually the main purpose of it. We're learning about cyclones and process here. The main thing I want to uh, point out to you is if you take a look at that cyclone over there on the, on the right hand side, that's a, 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 an air or uh, air solid separator. This is a shape you will see on many industrial buildings. Um, that sort of cycle, you've, you've seen it many times and should you visit any sort of industrial site. Uh, even the, the trucks that clean the streets in Hamilton have at least two cycles as they rake up the leaves and they, they de dust, uh, they remove the dust from the air before they uh, uh, vent it back to the atmosphere. So, this cyclone is a common shape you see on any, any company's property that's dealing with solids. They can also be used to treat liquids. So here on the left is a, a hydrocyclone. It's really there's no difference in operation other than replacing our fluid. Uh, is, is, is water or some form of liquid in this case. Whereas here uh, in most facilities it's, it's air or some sort of gas. The principles of operation are exactly the same. So let's just introduce some terminology here. We have our feed coming in tangentially. We'll take a look at the flow pattern in a minute. Um, the overflow, if there's any solids involved, there should be far less solids in the overflow. Most of the solids, it's particularly the larger particle size, in the coarser stream is the underflow. So this underflow is often called the coarse stream, and this overflow is often called fines. We have a vertical section over here, the cylindrical section, uh, which is exactly what it is. And then we have our conical section to taper down to the underflow exit. And that underflow exit is given several names, uh, but one that you may see from time to time is the spigot over there. Uh, especially in the British literature, you can see that terminology. And then the overflow is captured through what's called the vortex fine. So we'll, we'll take a look at the, at the velocity patterns here in a minute. Um, but that vortex finder is a very descriptive name. It, it, it captures that inner vortex um, and, and uses this pull out the material into the overflow stream. So, as you saw, uh, as you, many of you answered correctly in the assignment, these cycles are widely used in anywhere where there's uh, dust to be removed. That's its principal application. So, there's a few industries of this and many sawmills. Uh, one interesting one is uh, for capitalist 
particle removal. So if you've got any reactor that's involving a catalyst particle in a fluidized bed, uh, one way to recover those particles is then through the cycle. It's also used in applications to remove droplets from an airstream, so oil droplets or liquid droplets that need to be uh, be taken care of. Spray dried particles, so if you're making powdered milk or pelletized uh, powder material in the pharmaceutical industry, that would be common uh, to recover those small particles out of the airstream. Uh, cyclone is a very effective way of doing that. It's also uh, applied, as, we, as I said earlier, for liquids. Uh, you could, in fact, put two liquids through the, uh, through the cyclone that have different densities, and it can be used to separate those. There's applications for dewatering, or for, uh, what's called concentrating out the product, very much like the thickener we learned of earlier with sedimentation, where you want a, a more concentrated solid stream in order to dewater your suspension. I will talk about uh, in a minute why we can also dissolve gases out of the liquid stream. So if there's a, a volatile gas that's currently dissolved in our liquid stream, the cyclone, not necessarily its major application probably not even the best way to do it, but it is possible to degas uh, some liquid streams. And uh, also can be used interestingly for solid-solid separation. So if you've got two different solids with different densities, um, and particularly if those two solids have different shapes, uh, the, the, the way that one solid moves in the, in the airstream might have been more hindered than the other solid, and so you can separate those two quite nicely. Um, just when it comes to dust removal though, there are uh, many other ways of doing it. So the cyclones aren't the only, only possibility. Here's one option that plays on the fact that a particle has a greater momentum than the air itself. So an airstream with dust coming in here, that particle will have a greater momentum and hit the side and, and as it comes down it will be preferentially thrown out, whereas the airstream will, um, will turn around and go back up. So it just relies on, on, on moving the, the airstream around and forcing the dust out due to its high momentum. So that's one option. Which other options can you use to de-dust de air? Filters are the classic one at home. If you've got a furnace, you have your furnace filter. Um, any others? Electrostatic precipitators, so you can apply an electric currents through um, and preferentially attract the solid particles. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, at least five, ten other ways uh, of, of removing dust from air, but the, you'll see now cyclones are taking, um, taking a, a preference as a, as a unit to, to use just because they're so easy to operate and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, there's, there's no moving parts, there's very little overhead in operating costs. So let's start to take a look at how the solids and, and fluid stream flows through a cyclone. If we take a look at the top view over here on the left hand side, we see our inlet stream coming in with the dust. And it's, it's moved in in a tangential way to this cylindrical section. Um, so it moves in tangentially and starts to spiral around in the um, cylindrical section of the of the cyclone. Uh, we have a damper for flow control. We'll talk a bit about the importance of that in, uh, later on uh, to control the velocity of the inlet. But that's our primary method of controlling the efficiency of the cyclone. So the solids would come in and then and start to spin around here and spiral through the units. Let's take a look at, uh, at the flow pattern then. So we have our solids being fed in tangentially and here we're cycling counterclockwise, there's a spiral motion and that's our outer vortex formed purely by accelerating the, or pushing the feed in through the cycle tangentially. It forms also an inner vortex uh, that rotates in the same direction. So this inner vortex also rotates in the counterclockwise direction um, and its direction though is in the upper. <coughs> These particles on the outer periphery, we'll talk about that in a minute why they move in the downward direction. They're carrying the coarser solids and, and, and moving down, but 
if there's particles in there that are of smaller diameter, they will start to move to the interior and get trapped in that inner vortex. Your smaller particles will then be pulled upwards and taken out in that overflow stream. So that's the, that's the one way of viewing it. It's, it's a very simplistic flow pattern. It's far more complicated than that. Uh, particles will bounce around from the outer vortex to the inner vortex, then they will be thrown back into that outer vortex. If the velocities are so fast that you get somewhat turbulent flow in there, uh, they can bounce against the walls and then be hit back into the inner vortex, carried up, and then there can be a lot of jumping around. And you can see that quite nicely in that uh, video that I've given the link to over there. If you click on the hyperlink, um, the researcher has taken a particle and la labeled it uh, with the radioactive isotope, put it into basically an MRI type machine, a PET scanner, uh, similar shape to an MRI. And then for this video is about three and a half minutes, uh, but it's a, it's a delayed video. It's only three seconds that the particle spends in the cyclone, but the video is being stretched out to three and a half minutes to show you the path of travel that that single particle has taken. It's actually quite interesting to see see how it goes through, through there. So it's a, it's a phenomenally complex pattern in terms of the, the velocities. We're not even going to attempt to model it in this course. And any theoretical models that we do try to derive are probably ever an approximation to what's going on in there. So I'll show you a video in a minute uh, just to talk about what's, what's happening here. The main, the main principle of operation is that we're exploiting the density difference between the solid stream and the liquid stream. The great thing about the cyclone and why it's so widely used is the fact that there are no moving parts. And the operating class is only related to that pressure difference across the, across the uh, cyclone. So if we measure the pressure coming in, in our feed and the pressure leaving in the overflow stream, that's the delta P. So notice that the delta P is not the pressure coming in over the total pressure drop of the cyclone. The pressure drop for cyclones is defined as delta P over the inlet stream taken from the inlet stream to the gas out stream. So the pressure difference is measured across that top P to the gas out. Um, that is, is, is fairly, well, fairly minimal. It's about six kilopascals. In some cases, it can be a bit higher. Uh, it's a very small pressure drop, and that's really the only cost that you're paying for in terms of operating to you. You can make a cyclone yourself at home. There's a number of videos on YouTube that show you how to do it. It's, it's quite simple. The materials of construction are, are minor. Um, and so it's no surprise that we see a lot of cyclones in the industry because of that. They, they're good at capturing a variety of particle sizes from 5 microns and upwards, and very, very useful for uh, capturing the case when you have particles of different shapes. So if you separate two solids and they have different shapes, even the same density, we can often separate them out because we're exploiting the fact that the particle has a different uh, mode of travel if it's got a different shape. So we'll have a different settling velocity to the other, other particles, and so it can be separated. So uh, I'll, I'll show you a video again. If you go to YouTube and you look for cyclone videos, it seems everyone who does a computational fluid dynamics course has to do a cyclone simulation. There's thousands of them out there. So I've, I've looked through many of them. And this to me is probably one of the better ones. Let's just take a look at, uh, at, the, flow, at the flow patterns in this cycle. Smaller size particles 
then he finds find that inner vortex, the heavier particle, or the larger particles um, would go down and there's more dense particles. inside the cyclone look like while they're looking at this. What is the higher pressure, lower pressure? Okay, so this is the part line of the smaller particles. Small particles will, will follow that outer spiral for, for a while and then they'll get, they'll find that inner vortex and, and get pulled out and out. Whereas your larger particles then, uh, they, they remain on the outer boundaries and get removed in the underflow. So the velocity 
in that tangential direction is much lower at the wall than it is at the center of the, at the, center of the axis of the cyclone. Um, we have this relationship here that the velocity and the radius are, are related by this, this equation over here. So they're inversely related. We get higher velocities at smaller radiuses. And so at the wall, then, we get our lower velocity. That constant n is roughly 0.6 for most cyclones. And the interesting fact is that that tangential velocity is, um, this equation holds at any, any, at any point from the lowest point of the cyclone to the upper point of the cyclone. Uh, so even though the cyclone is changing the, the radius as it, as it comes through its conical section, um, that equation still holds. So if you want to try to understand the, the, the path the particle will take in the cyclone, one way is just to use Stokes' law. Um, and that's in fact how most of the models are derived. Very interestingly, it is most, it's, it's actually quite a good approximation to use the Reynolds number less than one region. Surprisingly, considering the high velocities of over five to 10 meters per second, if you calculate the Reynolds number in the cyclone, it very often is lower than one. So the, the, the use of Stokes law to model the, the force balance of these particles is actually quite is, is a valid approximation. So well, there's, there's two major forces that act on a particle. So if you consider a particle of a certain diameter, there's the, the centrifugal force that acts on that particle to throw it towards the, the cyclone wall. So that's the same centrifugal force we saw um, in the previous section on centrifuges, acting in the direction. Uh, this arrow refers to this specific diagram only. Um, the way it's drawn here, the centrifugal force will act from the center of the axis to the, to the wall to, to force that particle of a given diameter outwards. But then there's the drag on the particle as well, acting in the, in the, count, in the, in the counter direction. If those two forces are balanced, that particle will stay at a, at a fixed radius in the cycle. And it will just keep orbiting at that radius. And in fact, that's what, what many of the particles do, is they orbit at that fixed radius at a given cross, at a given height in the, in the cycle. But then there's also the vertical forces uh, and, and, and upward forces that, that pull on the particle. So as they're rotating in a fixed orbit, they're also being pulled up or down, depending on where they are. And that is what, what then puts them into the inner vortex or keeps them in the outer vortex. So they get, they get pulled in this, in this axial, uh, up and down in the axial direction, and then they'll either leave in the underflow if they're a larger particle, or they'll move to the inner vortex when they leave in the overflow. But uh, there's also this balance in this direction that they need to take care of, and that's um, due to the centrifugal force and the drag force of the particle. So it's not an easy thing to model, and we don't plan to do this in the course, but understand that there's, there's, there's a balance of forces in, in the cycle. So key things here. One, it's not gravity that's pulling those particles out in the underflow. People often mistake it, that those heavier particles are leaving due to gravity. In fact, we never take gravity into account when we uh, do the models for a cycle. Uh, interestingly, you can operate a cyclone upside down, and those particles will, in the underflow, will still leave in the underflow. So it's very, it's common to operate cyclones horizontally uh, for space regions in, in many companies. You could operate them upside down if you wanted any any orientation, except for the very large cyclones where you've got much much slower velocities. Then the gravitational force does play a small role, uh, and you wouldn't operate those uh, upside down or vertical horizontally. What pulls the heavier particles out is that slower boundary layer flow against the walls. So those particles are, flow, are flowing slower. There's also this pressure gradient. If you've got this flow coming in, it has to be either at the top or the bottom. Uh, so that's what's driving the flow through the cyclone. But it's not gravity that's pulling out the heavier particles at all. Um, as I mentioned earlier, particles will rotate at a, at a radial point from the center to the wall along that radius where those forces are balanced. And the larger particles will get to tend to throw, be thrown against the wall just because of their, their momentum. The key thing here is we want a long, a longish residence time in the cyclone. The longer that residence time is in the cyclone, 
the better your separation can be because you're giving those particles ample time to find their equilibrium orbit and then be put into either the inner vortex to be removed into the overflow or they get put into the uh, vortex for the underflow. If they're in for too short, they can, uh, they can uh, if, you, if you're overloading the cyclone with a very high flow rate, you will find the larger particles can bypass and leave in the overflow. Or conversely, your smaller particles will leave in the underflow. It'll be exactly where you don't want them. So that keeping that resonance time is, is critical. And the way we do that is to balance um, the forces, and the way we easily, uh, most easily adjust that is through the inlets and outlet velocities. So those dampers on the inlets and the dampers on the outlets to control the velocity are the way we control the, the cyclone's performance. So the efficiency with which the cyclone works is, is controlled by the velocities. So let's take a look at how we evaluate the performance of the cyclone. So this is, the, this is the new theory we need to understand, and, and uh, what I'm going to show you now applies to any solid fluid operation, uh, sedimentation, centrifuges, and, and others. So if we consider our feed to have a certain particle size distribution, our fines, we should find them have a particle size distribution that's skewed to the left. So we've got a greater a, a domination of, of the smaller particles, and then our force stream uh, is the opposite. If we just take the mass flows in and out, at steady state, we've got a mass capital M flowing in, and then the mass of fines and the mass of force particles, <laughs> and sum together to add. So let's define a new term here called efficiency. This is a standard term that's used. Efficiency is defined as the mass flow in the core stream divided by the total mass flow. Uh, there's not too much to interpret here. There's some obvious things, the zero efficiency would mean that you're sending all your mass to the fines. 100% efficiency means that everything is going to your underflow or stream. Okay, so that's, there's nothing too surprising about that. But now we take that same equation for efficiencies based on mass flows of the entire stream, but we're going to be a bit more specific. We're going to look at it at every particle size. So if we take the mass flow of the core stream, and we multiply it by the fraction of the particles of a certain size x in that same stream. And then in our denominator, we use the mass flow coming into the cyclone or to the unit. And we divide and we multiply that by the fraction of the particles of that, that size x. So x is in micrometers. What fraction of the particles in our feed stream have a certain size x in micrometers? And multiply that by the total flow. And then in our numerator, it's the same idea, but for the underflow stream, the course stream. And we can calculate this efficiency for every size fraction. So g of x is then a function of x, the size fraction. So let's just quickly recap what, this, what I mean by size fraction. If we take our, our frequency distribution, this is what we get when we use those uh, sieves or the screens that we looked at in the previous class. We can construct a distribution of particle sizes for a given stream, and the area under that curve is one or 100%. So if I say, for this given region in blue, what is the fractional area in that stream, that fraction of the blue area divided by the total area under the, under the curve, which is one or 100%, uh, in other words, that area there gives me the fraction of the particles. So that's exactly the term that I use over there. The fraction of the size at a given value of x um, in, the, in the stream. So when we say x, we usually mean not a single number, but we usually give it a range, just because we cannot possibly work with every single size. So we, we, we group them up into discrete bins, and we say what is the fraction over there for each particle size. So let's take a look at some, some of the properties of this g of x. We're going to construct a grade efficiency curve. Um, actually, let me just show you what one of those look like so you can see where we're headed. This is a curve g of x, so it's something along these lines. So we're going to take this first curve over here. Don't worry about the annotation on this plot. That's the curve we're after, and it's a function of the particle size x here on the x-axis. So if we, if we just take a look at this equation, one of the key ways we evaluate the efficiency of a unit is to look at where g of x is equal to 50%. That's, that's probably the most widely used measure of performance for a cyclone or a sedimentation vessel or any of 
of these solid building operations is what is the grade efficiency at the 50 percent point? It's called the cut size. What if, why is that a, a useful metric and why is it called the cut size? Well, if we plug in g of x is equal to 0.5 over here on the, on the left, what that implies then is that for a given particle size, x, half of the stream coming into our cyclone with that particle size is leaving in the underflow and half of the particles of that size x are leaving in the overflow. Okay, so the add for, for particles exactly of that size x or within that range of sizes x, we've got a, a, a set of material coming into our cyclone. Half of that material is leaving in the overflow and half is in the underflow. Okay, so that's how g of x equal 50% should be interpreted. You can also look at g of x equals to 1. Uh, by this equation, that implies that the numerator and the denominator are, are the same value when g of x is 1. So that implies that the particles of that size x get captured 100% in the coarse stream. So all the particles of that size x, where g of x is equal to 1, if I took a look at an actual example on this curve, where g of x is equal to 1, that says that all particles of, let's say, for most intents and purposes, that g of x is, is equal to 1 after, after 65 microns. 65 microns, all particles 65 microns and greater will leave in our coarse stream in the underflow. The other way to see that is that the largest particle you should ever see in your overflow is 65 microns. That would be a, the, the other way of, of interpreting it. So the largest particle size we ever expect to see in the overflow is also whatever that x value is. Okay. So let's just take a look then at, at some efficiency curves for various cycles. We can easily or fairly easily construct one of these curves for a given cyclone operating at steady state. So this curve is for a given cyclone at its typical operating conditions. And the cut size for this for that very for the curve over there, you simply say at 50% cut size, move across and come down and it's, it's 10 microns. So for this cyclone, 10 microns, which the cut size implies that particles of 10 microns coming in, half of those particles by mass weight would leave in the overflow. Half of the particles in, in our overflow by mass weight would be at 10 microns. So, so that's the interpretation of the cut size. <coughs> if you wanted to design a cyclone that had material split so that at 10 microns, So I've got g of x over here. If we had a perfect cyclone that split our particles exactly for us, we would have an efficiency curve that, that did that. Okay, so if we wanted particles of 15 microns and smaller to be in our underflow, so this is our sorry, 15 microns and, and smaller in our overflow, and I want the particles 15 microns and greater to be in my coarse stream. It would be awesome if I could find a cyclone that had almost this step function shape efficiency. <coughs> but you will we'll never find a cyclone that does that for us. We'll only ever find cyclones that at best have a shape like that. So our cut size here at 50% is still the same value of 50 microns, but we'll always have this slow smearing through there. So we will get particles that are smaller than 50 microns in our underflow, and we'll get particles of 50 microns greater in our overflow. So we'll never get a perfect separation. If we had a step function, we would get a perfect separation, but we, we will never have that in fact. So we always have this S-shaped uh, and the other thing that we, we often look for is in this grade efficiency curve is we look at, at where the efficiency reaches 100%. So if we, let's ask this question, which is a better cyclone? If we wanted to design a cyclone to remove all particles, so we want an airstream leaving the overflow that had as few solid particles in it, which of those 
upgrading, uh, which of those cyclones, there is five different cyclones would you, would you want to use? If you wanted to remove all your solids.
a greater delta P will get you a greater efficiency. A higher pressure drop will get you a higher efficiency with some diminishing returns. Efficiency is also affected by the solids concentration. So one of those, I think the third YouTube video I linked to back there shows a video of three cyclones side by side operating with different solids uh, percentages coming in. What we want is we always want our solids percentage in the image to be as dilute as possible. So the lower the concentration of solids that you have coming in, the higher the efficiency that you get to recover them. So it's not uncommon for um, companies to add excess air into that feed to the cycle. So if air is free, we just add in more air, dilute our stream up, and we get higher recovery um, of our solids. So it means that you need to buy more cyclones or operate many small cyclones in parallel than if you needed to treat the same quantity of solids. But to get a greater efficiency, uh, we want to operate with dilute streams. And then, very important here is two pieces of advice from Perry's. One is to leave the underflow diameter, that opening at the bottom, leave that as, a, as a, some variable that you can adjust day to day on the, on the cycle, because that's going to be uh, one of the easiest things to adjust and one of the most effective variables that you can adjust. And if you have any air leaks at that point, that will drop the efficiency right down. Uh, so, so this is the recap in some of the advantages and disadvantages here. One is that the main advantage of, of these units is that they're small and cheap. Uh, they're, they're really tiny. You can mount many of them in a very small uh, surface area. They're cheap to manufacture. You can orient them in any direction, and they, they can even be reused. So if you have a cycle that you bought previously for one use, you can almost certainly be able to reuse it for something else in the future. <coughs> And you're only, uh, only operating over there with the delta P, which is essentially just electrical cost, which is very cheap. Now, there are two disadvantages. One is, of course, that you're going to abrade that outer edge if you've got uh, very aggressive material uh, going through there. You cannot use these for a stream that requires flocculation. So if you're using these, uh, you're adding flocculant, you probably want to add the flocculant downstream of the cyclone, just because of those high shear forces that the particles will you're going to break up your clocks uh, with, this, with this device. Uh, there are some limitations on the efficiency curves. We don't ever get something as nice as I have drawn on the blackboard with the most vertical shape. You never see that. Uh, you see very gradual S bends. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a bit about how we can improve that efficiency in a minute. Uh, the, and then the other thing to realize is that these units uh, are best operated at, some, at consistent conditions. So if you've got a, a, a plant which has got a variable production rate and variable concentration in your stream, you're going to get variable efficiencies coming out of this unit. So one way to often do that, to handle this, is to then dilute your feed stream to the cyclone, and then you have many cyclones in parallel, and you, you bring them online as needed. So you split your stream out across many cyclones and, and handle that variability uh, in that way. So you always have the cyclones operating in as constant conditions as possible, and you bring them on in dis discreetly as you, as you need extra, extra to handle your excess feed. Okay, so uh, what I just want to talk about here in, in the last few minutes, just to introduce the concept here, this is, this is not for exams or tests or anything, it's more just to help you understand what and then start to think about the, the rest of this course is we're going to start to combine these units together and, how, and what that's going to do. So if we have one cyclone, one separation unit, and, and it's not performing quite as we need, so it doesn't quite have the cut side that we're looking for, or that curve isn't as steep as, we, as we're hoping, uh, or we need to operate it at high concentrations, uh, what, what are some of the things we can do? Well, we can look at, at at sequencing these units. So this is now where it's going to get really interesting. Is if this is the efficiency curve for one cyclone, what happens if you put two cyclones in series? And in particular, we send the overflow of the first cyclone as the feed to the second cyclone. So you're sending your smaller particles to be separated once more, and then your underflow is being collected and combined. So take the underflow from the first cyclone and the second cyclone, combine them, 
And that underflow, that joint underflow stream is what defines that second division stream. And then similarly, if you have three, three cycles in series, you get that sort of division well, it's, it's not, uh, well, first, the first obvious thing from doing this is that your cut point changes. So at 50%, if I go at 50% and move really horizontally, my cut point for three cycles in series is at a lower diameter. I can get smaller particles more effectively with three cycles in series than with two cycles or than with one cycle. Here with one cycle, my cut point is about 10 microns. With two cycles, it's about eight. And then with three cycles, it's about five. So I can, I can improve where my cut size is by adding cycles in series. That steepness of the curve changes by a small amount, but it actually also improves for more cycles in series. But you, you lose the benefit after three or four cycles. So there's not too much benefit after that particular point. Then um, you can do other interesting things and start to recycle streams. So if I take my overflow and I bring it back in and, and refeed it to my cyclone, depending on what that recycle ratio is, so capital Q divided by small q is defined as my recycle ratio. With higher recycle ratios, I can Get, I'm essentially diluting that feed stream. So that was what I said earlier, that dilution of the feed is, is, is really uh, can improve the efficiency, and you can see that over here. As, my, as I increase my recycle rate, I'm able to recover uh, more and more particles uh, of, of smaller sizes. Again, there's diminishing returns after you reach about three, three weeks. And then the final one that I'd like to take a look at is this let you think about this one for a minute is what is um, if you connect your cyclones in series, but this time sending the underflow from the first cyclone to the second cyclone, and then if I have three in series, I, I do that once more and send the underflow to the third cyclone. What's happened here to the efficiency curve is it's gotten worse. Compared to the base case of a single cyclone, now if I have two cyclones in series or three cyclones in series, my efficiency curves have actually dropped down. Um, my, my cut size, if anything, has moved over to, to larger particles. That's not something we want to aim for. So what would be the purpose of, um, of something like this setup? More particles of a particular size in your underflow. Yes. So with this, with this setup is is very effective at is, is concentrating up that underflow to a higher percentage uh, percentage solids in your underflow uh, is when we would use this. But we were recognizing that by doing this, we're approximating essentially a thickener tank or a sedimentation vessel uh, that that's, whose aim is to thicken and get a, a high percentage solids in the underflow. Cyclones in series where you're cascading the underflow from one cycle to the next is, is starting to achieve that, that same effect. So, so this is where I, I'm just putting this up here for you to start thinking about this um, because we're going to have to, as this course progresses, we're going to get a bit more creative and start to link our units and the nerves about together. We have to understand that, how that is going Okay, so tomorrow's class is the next lecture on membranes and uh, we'll begin that section of the course.